weeks, we've been looking at a bunch of clocks behind me. And maybe you're here for the first time in eight weeks and visiting this morning. We as a congregation have been looking at the last days. Uh, in, in theology, it's called eschatology, the doctrine of the last times, the end times, things that will happen. They will happen before Jesus comes back again. It's been a fast eight weeks. We've talked about a number of subjects relating to this material. And this morning, uh, we conclude this series uh, by coming uh, to what we're going to understand at, as, as the new heaven and the new earth. Um, just in case you're wondering, sometimes I hear people say, I can't wait to go to heaven and to be with God for eternity. Bad theology. You're going to go to heaven when you die, but the heaven that as it is now is not going to be there when Jesus comes back. You're not going to live with Jesus in heaven for eternity. You're going to live in this place called the new heaven and the new earth. And to approach this this morning, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 21. Just a powerful passage that gives us a taste, both chapter 21 and 22, just a taste of what's coming, but yet so much a mystery to us. I scratched my head a lot in the last month as I began preparing this message, saying, wow, but yeah, but wow, I, we're not going to get it all. And I think God does it on purpose, just for the surprise factor, so that we can be wowed all the more. Revelation chapter 21, found on page 1891 in the Bible in front of you. And may I ask... Uh, Read through these last two chapters sometime today or in the, week, in the days to come to get the full gist of what this new heaven and earth is going to be like, both of these chapters. But for this morning, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. This is uh, the Apostle John speaking, one of Jesus' disciples. He's 90 years old. He's on the island of Patmos, and he had this unbelievable vision from God, this vision to say, this is what this new heaven and earth is going to be like. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, I'm not going to speak about that in the message, but the reason he says that is simply because the sea was the place where there were sea monsters and evil and everything else. There's going to be water in the new heaven and the new earth, no doubt. He says no sea because that was just a bad place uh, where, where evil existed in the New Testament. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things had passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of you have read uh, one of the books in the Chronicles of Narnia? You're way ahead of me. Can you believe it? I'm 61 years old, and I have not read yet the Chronicles of Narnia. Now, it's my fault only, because my wife has like a zillion copies of them in her, in her library, and she's read them more than once. And my children have read that entire series as well. But I was reminded in my research in the past uh, several weeks 
of, of this quote from the, the last, I believe, the last book in this series called The Last Battle. Uh, listen to this quote that is given by C.S. Lewis, the author. I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up and come further in. He, he's speaking about in his terms this new land, this promised land that the Narnia children and leaders looked forward to as well. The land I never knew till now, come further up, come further in. This morning, we're going to take a few moments, and, and you have to imagine with me a little bit this morning, but we're going to just take a trip in our minds. Boy, we're going to stay in our seats, boys and girls, but we're going to take a trip in our minds as, as we go to this place called the new heaven and the new earth, and we're going to envision four different things that we know about according to Revelation 21 that are going to be at this place, this, this land. That for those of us who, who've uh, asked for forgiveness of sins and repented of our sins and been received by God because of the cross, we're going to just step into this place, into this land called the new heaven and the new earth. This place that you should be looking forward to. I don't think we talk about it enough because we get so caught up into this life and to this world. But I want you to listen closely. If you love Jesus, if you believe that he died for you, this is your future. This is going to be your home that you live in through eternity. As I said earlier, not in heaven. Get that out of your mind. Bad theology. That's where you go when you die, before Jesus returns. But when Jesus returns, there's a new place that will be already made for those of us who love Jesus. That place that we're looking forward to is called the new heaven and the new earth, according to verse 1. The new heaven and the new earth. Why is it new? What happened to the old? What does it say? The first heaven, this is why you're not going to be in the heaven as it is now, because the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. Right? We read earlier, and weeks earlier, about 2 Peter 3, God is going to destroy the present heavens and earth. There is a new heaven and a new earth, that is, I believe, already set, ready to go until the day Jesus returns and, and, and he brings it down from heaven with him. The new heaven and the new earth. Now, you might not think that a word like new is that big of a deal, N-E-W. Th this is where understanding the original languages helps a whole lot because this puts a whole new uh, wowness, really, in, in the factor of understanding the new heaven and the earth. There are a number of words in Greek. I'm just going to teach a Greek a really quick a couple words. There are a number of words for new in Greek. These are the two main words. One is neos, which has to do with um, something being brand new, new in origin, new in time, never seen before. So if you're studying the Greek language and a passage talking about something new with neos, that means this is the first time you've ever seen something like this in your life. You've never seen like it, something like it before. Of, of new origin. That's neos. Kainos is also a word for new, which is a word we find through most of Revelation, as we find it here in chapter 21. And th this word really helps me understand what this new heaven and earth is going to be like, because this Greek word it, it has nothing to do with it, something brand new or new in origin. But it has to do with something that a kind of was already present, but but restored, renewed, reconstructed from what is already there. Think about it in this way. Some of you like uh, shows like, uh, at least in the past, this old house still on? Those of you who watch this old house? In, in the past, I think uh, Extreme Makeover was on for a while. I, I used to watch that. I don't think that's on anymore. And the, the, the most recent one that I hear people talk about a lot is what? Fixer Upper. Hey, fixer upper, extreme makeover, this old house, all the same kind of things. Uh, th this word kainos, new heaven and earth, it, it is, is really talking about God says, I'm going to come down out of heaven with a new heaven and a new earth. And now, speaking specifically of the new earth, I got some remodeling to do. I'm going to reconstruct this earth to its original beauty. 
And what that simply means is that there's going to be similarities, just like with this old house or extreme makeover or fixer-upper. You can kind of, when you step into one of these homes, take a look and say, wow, I, I kind of recognize some of the stuff that was here, but it's like renewed. Uh, almost, it looks brand new, but I know it's not because there are still some similarities or resemblances of the old. Now think about this with a new earth. That tells me that when God comes down with this new heaven and earth, we're going to be able to look around and see a lot of things that look familiar and similar, like trees and flowers and mountains and rivers. It's going to be earth as we remember it to some degree, except it's going to be gloriously renewed. Going back to like when Eden was this perfect place to live with Adam and Eve. And some people call this new earth a paradise regained, the new Eden. So if you wonder what the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like when you leave this morning, of course, you look out, you can't really look outside and have an idea because right now we're in the fall season where things die. The new heaven and earth, if we would walk outside this morning, guess what? There would be green leaves on the trees. There would be flowers all over the place that never die. I read some, something else that, we, that talked about uh, there will be fruit trees that bear fruit all year round. Just, just try... We can't comprehend it, but try to get it in your minds, this place of such perfection, looking like, similar to what we've had, but gloriously renewed and remodeled and reconstructed. Maybe you've done some of this kind of work in your home and you know what I'm talking about. What you had before you remodeled the kitchen and what you have now. Similar to the old, but gloriously renewed. I looked at some real estate ads uh, this year to talk about some of these houses that are for sale, and I found a few phrases that say, you know what, that's what the new earth is going to be like. How does this sound regarding a house in the area? It has the charm of yesteryear. Yeah, this is a new earth. It will have the charm of yesteryear, but so much more, so much more that way you can even begin to imagine. Another this is true paradise. How fitting, I thought. True paradise. Paradise regained. Gone no longer things that we're going to talk about in just a few moments. But this glorious new place called heaven and earth, which we can only begin to have some idea in our mind what it will be like. And I think God does it on purpose just to give us this big surprise. This big surprise when he comes. This place we're looking forward to, this new heaven and earth, gloriously renewed from what we have now. John says, come further with me into this land. And he says, let me tell you more about what I, what I saw when I had this vision. And he says, I saw a new city. The holy city in the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I saw a new city. What? what? What do you think is the greatest city that, that you'd want to live in today on earth? None. Roselawn. Is Roselawn even a city? I think it's a village, isn't it? Demont. Yeah, it's not a, bad, not a bad place to live. A lot, of, a lot of less busyness in this area. But is there a place that you would think, if I have a place that I could go and live and really enjoy life like I've never enjoyed it before, this What's the number one place in the world is the destination people want to live in, according at least to polls that were taken? Number one city, the greatest city to live in is? You don't know, do you? London! I've never been there. Maybe you've got to go there and, and find that out. But London was number one. Paris was number two. And then this place, speaking of new, was new New York. New York. I've never been there either. I don't have a desire even to go there. Maybe I should, but I'm told best not to visit unless you have somebody take you in the cab all over the place here and there. Those are what some people think are the great cities that you want to live in. When I think of great cities that, that, that I'd want to live in or cities that I thought, wow, would, ever, would it ever be cool to see a city like that? This is what I think of. Who knows what this is? Emerald City. Oh, the Wizard of Oz, I grew up on it. And I remember, I still, the first time I went to bed and I didn't dare to go to sleep because of those monkeys. <laughs> Seriously, coming home from church Sunday night, black and white 
TV yet right back then? And I must have been seven, eight, or nine. And these monkeys just, I couldn't handle it. And of course, you're, I have six brothers, right? So I'm like, I'm not going to tell any of them that I'm scared. Bad, bad news. But what I liked was this city, this, this emerald city of gems and of stones, the capital in the land of Oz. And I thought, oh, if ever such a city existed, that's a big, good place to go and kind of visit. Well, interestingly enough, we come to Revelation 21, and we find this, this place called the Holy City, the New Jerusalem. I want you to look at this for a moment. Does that look like a city? If, if you read through Revelation 21 and 22, you'll find detailed, detailed descriptions of what this city looks like. In fact, if you want to write down the verses in, in chapter 21, verses 10 through 26, and then chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, talk about gold, talk about gemstones. I don't think I even can pronounce all of these gems that are in this city. But this doesn't look like a city to me, except if you follow the rules and the measurements of Revelation 20 and 21, this is what you get. It's a perfect cube. Now, if you believe this is literally what, what the city looks like, listen to this. How big is it? If you do the math, the stadii, or whatever they're talking about in these two chapters, if it's true, this is exactly what this city will look like, it would almost fill just this, this city. Picture this cube coming down out of heaven. Those are entryways and gates around it. 1,400 miles wide, long, and high. How big is that? It almost covers the whole United States. Now that's, that's pretty big, isn't it? And this is just the city. This isn't the whole new earth. This is the capital city of the new heaven and earth. 1,400 miles in every direction. And then when you start reading, in, especially in, uh, I believe it's 22 verses 1 through 5, about oh, this, this talk, talk, emerald city, forget that. All of the, the beauty of the gems and the gold. Some of us have all those old hymns in our minds of, of uh, these streets of gold. Are there really going to be streets of gold? Is there really going to be a city like this, 1,400 miles wide, high, and, and deep, like this cube coming out of heaven? Maybe you want to go to the sermon discussion class afterwards. Maybe those who, who go to that or lead that can take this into consideration. Even read these verses 10 through 26 and then chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Because there are a number of, of sound theologians who believe this isn't really literally a city that's going to come down on earth. It could be symbolic, right? Revelation is apocalyptic literature. When you get to apocalyptic literature, you've got to do justice to what it is. So many things... Are, are of symbolism in Revelation. Some believe this symbolizes a great city that's coming, but some believe that this great city symbolizes just the, the, the people of God who were saved. The church, beautifully dressed for its bride. I still kind of believe, I, I really do believe this is, there's going to be a literal city called the New Jerusalem, but I just want to be care with, careful with my own ignorance. Because if we think we begin to know it all, exactly what it's going to be like, they don't go there. But if you believe this is this, this literal city, you go right ahead. Because that's, that's just impressive. Or if it's symbolic of something other, go ahead and believe that. But believe there is going to be such a city, whether it's a literal building or whether it's the people of God. Uh, there's good arguments for both sides. I saw a new Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down. And the reason I think it's real because, man, these, these, the descriptions are, are so detailed. Kind of like the temple, kind of like the tabernacle. So detailed that I lean on the side of it still being a literal city. John says, come along with me and, tell, and, and let me tell you what I see. I see a new heaven and a new earth, this, this gloriously renewed place. I see this city, this, this new Jerusalem. He said, forget about Emerald City. You've got to see this city. Absolutely Amazing, And then he says, now still, come further into the land. He says, I, I saw something else. And it's something about, speaking of new things, a new neighbor. Look at this verse again, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be 
their God. How many of you like really have a next door neighbor? And I know in these parts, not everybody does. Do you have like a next door neighbor? Yes? Now the question is, do you like your next door neighbor? And do you like having that person living next door to you? Some people don't have very good next door neighbors and I hope you're not one of them. It's good to be a good neighbor. When we talk about the new heaven and the new earth, we talk about next door neighbors. And I always kind of kid with some people if, if they're uh, having a bad day and complaining about their neighbor or complaining about another Christian that they don't get along with very well, what do you think I say to them? What do you think I'm, when, they, when Jesus comes <coughs> and they're going to live in eternity, what do you think I say to them about that neighbor, or that person? I say, God is going to put you next to that person in the new Jerusalem forever. So you better get to like this person now. Because God's going to put that person as your neighbor and you're going to live with that person through eternity. Probably not. And anyway, it's going to be so different. You would not, never even remember that that person wasn't necessarily a very good neighbor to you. <coughs> Just a moment. <coughs> Who's your neighbor? Who's going to be your neighbor? <coughs> One thing we know, that when we get on this new heaven and the new earth, we're going to have a neighbor, and not just other Christians. <clears throat> this is a big deal. Listen. Our new neighbor is going to be God. God is going to be our new neighbor. Notice what he says. I, I, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. You see, right now we're separated. Right now, there is a place called heaven where God lives, even though he's everywhere present. But that's where he lives. That's, that's where Jesus lives, next to him. Heaven and earth, are they together right now? No. Jesus ascended into heaven, and that's where he is right now. There's a separation that exists. Even though God is everywhere present, and he's present here this morning, because he dwells in the presence of his people, Right now, we're separated from him. Think about loved ones that you have because they live a long ways away. There's a separation that exists. You would like them living with you or by you, but you can't because of the separation. Sometimes I talk about it, and we're in two different zip codes. Heaven has one zip code. Earth has another zip code. And until Jesus comes back again, that separation is always going to be felt and experienced. But John tells us, look what I see. God is going to come down himself, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he's going to dwell alongside of us as a new neighbor. Can you imagine having God as a next door neighbor? Having God as a next door neighbor, literally, the word used, I won't tell you that, but it's talk about somebody pitching their tent in the same campground. Isn't that cool? God is going to pitch his tent in the same campground that you and I are living in for eternity. No longer separated, but now together forever in this place called the new heaven and the new earth. Because God can't dwell with us in this way now because of sin. God is holy. He doesn't dwell in the same place where there's sin and impurity. But when he comes down and, and renovates everything and renews everything, sin is gone. And he lives with those who are his throughout eternity, living next door to us forever in his presence. And then John says, listen, talking about new things, he says, just like Lewis said to the, to the kids from Narnia, he says, come still further in with me to this place called the new heaven and the earth. He says, let me tell you about something else that I see, and it's called the new normal. I want that term just to get in your head for a moment. Something else I see. He says, this, this, this new heaven and earth is going to be a new normal. What's the new normal? According to what we read, right now there's this place called earth which our normal would be, and as John states here in verse 4, he said, a place of tears, a place of death, a place of mourning, a place of crying 
and a place of pain. This is the normal that we have right now, and I hate it. And I hope you hate it too. Don't you hate it? You think you can escape it for some time? But it always catches up with you. We live in a place where there are tears and mourning and death and pain and crying. And I have yet to meet a person who says, boy, I love this place because of that. Can't wait for the next one. This is the norm right now as it's over in this earth. But the good news is there's a, there's a new normal coming, this place called the new earth. And verse 4 makes it very clear what the new normal is going to be. Well, you just take this verse to heart, put it up all over the house, put it in your heart when you're going through a difficult time. Because the new normal in the new heaven and earth is going to be no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things are passed away. Wow. No more. Listen, I wrote a bunch of things. These are, these are what some of the no mores. And you can have your own. Shout it out if you want as I read some of these. But this is what to expect in the new heaven and earth when it comes to no more. No more sickness, no more death, no more looking as some of us who are older do in the paper to see who died next in the obituary page. No more disease, no more terminal illness, no more cancer, no more Alzheimer's, no more depression, no more anti depressants, no more suicidal thoughts or suicides, no more anxiety, no more stress, worry, or loneliness, no more divorce, custody battles, broken relationships, no more synagogue shootings and gang violence and murders and wars, no more broken dreams and broken promises and broken hearts, no more injustices in the world. And how about this? No more political bickering. No more, no more, no more. There's a new normal coming. This is what you've got to set your eyes on and your heart on. Don't fall in love with this place too much. There's a new normal coming where there's ultimate health and harmony and prosperity in the new heaven, in the new earth. As I'm preaching this, I'm just reminded in Hebrews, I think it's 11 verse 10, you can read that today, too, sometime, that chapter where Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he talks about, I'm looking forward to a new country. He says, I don't know what it's all going to be like, but God promised me there's going to be this great place. And he wasn't just speaking of where he was moving on to. He was talking about this city that, where God is the, 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 the builder and the architect. God already was giving him a vision of this new place that God has in store. It's that same kind of thing going on here. John says, look, let me take you further into this because here you have what's called the new normal. And he says, who in the world would not just want to grasp that and, and have it now? We get so much in love with this earth that sometimes we, and we say, well, I'd like to go to heaven someday, but not yet. <laughs> I don't know why we would ever talk that way. The new heaven and the new earth. John says, listen, this is the land that we're looking forward to. you got to let it sink in. And he says, listen, just as God says in verse 5, I'm making everything new. Don't fall in love with the old too much. Don't know how you can. I'm making everything new, a new earth, a new city, a new neighbor, a new normal. He says, John, write this stuff down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And in verse 6, being the Alpha and the Omega, God says, it's done. To me, it simply means the city is ready. The new earth and the new heaven is ready, awaiting the day for Christ's return when he brings this new city and this new earth with him. It's done. Now, one thing in closing, and, and you've got to listen to this too, because this is a big deal, because there are still people who say, everybody's going to live in this city someday. Doesn't matter how you live. Doesn't matter what you believe. God is a loving God, and everyone he's created is going to be part of this new earth and this new city and have God as his neighbor and have the no more life. But you know what? That's not what the Bible says. 
That's not what John says. You've got to listen very carefully. Look at these verses. What does he say in verse 7? Who's going to be living in the new heaven and the new earth? Verse 7 says, these are the people who are going to live there. Just in case you're wondering if, if there's a place for you. Those who are victorious, another word for that would be overcomers. If you read through earlier Revelation 2 and 3, overcoming was a key word. Those who are victorious, those who are overcomers will inherit all of this. I will be their God and they will be my people. These are people who believed that Jesus Christ was their Lord and Savior. These are people who stepped forward and said, I'm a sinner and I know I need to come to God in, in Jesus Christ in repentance and faith and I believe that Jesus died in the cross to save me from my sins and I believe that he rose from the dead and that I will live with him someday on the new heaven and the new earth because of that. Nothing that I can do can get me into this new, this new place, this new earth. It's all because of God's grace through Jesus Christ. And John very clearly says, those who are victorious will inherit all of this. Is everybody victorious? No. Is everybody saved? Let's find out. Verse 8, who's not going to be there? But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. We talked last week about this place called hell. You can get a, a DVD as you leave this morning. You see, everyone is not going to be in this new city. There are those who are believing who will, but very clearly in verse 8, those who do not believe, those who have not responded to Jesus Christ in faith, will not be in this place called the new earth for eternity. Well, the, la the last eight weeks we spent time in this, this thing called eschatology, the last days, the end times. And the whole point of, of this series was just to get us thinking again because sometimes we get into a lull thinking this earth is going to go on forever. Jesus is going to come again. Even, even though it's been 2,000 years since he left, it's easy to get into this mindset of, well, you know, it's going to be another two or three or four or 5,000 years, whatever. I'm not going to have to think about it so much. But God wants you to think about it because he wants you to get ready. That's why this series was called Be Ready, Ready or Not, Here I Come. In Revelation 22, as, as we, we first answered that eternity question, do I know for sure this is going to be my eternal home? That's a, the biggest question you ever have to ask in this life. Is this going to be my eternal home? Jesus says, listen, uh, I am coming again. That day is set. I am coming again. I'm a God who keeps every promise that has ever been made. My reward is with me. I'll give to each person according to what they have done. I'm coming again. And the good news is, this is really good news. You can still have this place as your eternal home as long as you have breath. But God just doesn't give it to you because you show up at church, because you do good things. He doesn't give it to you for anything that you've done. He gives it to you because of what Jesus has done. And the good news is the opportunity is still before everyone here this morning to say, Boy, I want to be in this place, this new place with all of these new and wonderful things, this, this place for eternity. He says, listen, in Revelation 22, verse 17, almost one of the last verses in the Bible. Can you get it for me? Thank you. This, this invitation, this is almost pretty close. If you, look, if you look at the scriptures, really close to one of the last verses in the Bible. God says... Through John, he says, look, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let all those who hear, as you're hearing this morning, come. Let those who are thirsty, come. And let all who wish to take of the free gift of the water of life, come. What's the best invitation you're ever going to get? In other words, God offers this to everyone. And if you're not sure this is your place yet, you can get on your knees before God today and say, I want to live here through eternity. Boy, this sounds good to me. And you just need to surrender to Jesus Christ and get this free gift because that's what it is, right? This free gift, we are saved by grace through faith. And maybe today, and maybe because of this series that you've heard, 
God is going to draw you in to his presence and to himself. And you can come to know Jesus like so many of us do here. You can find a church home to come and worship. You're welcome to be with us. Because we want you to get up every morning with the assurance that this is where you will spend eternity as well in this wonderful, unbelievable, mysterious place called the new heaven and the new earth, this city that we long for as well. I hope you enjoyed this morning stepping in and further in to this place called the new heaven and the new earth. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. There is so much mystery. There's so much unknown to us about what this place is going to be like in its fullness. Thank you this morning that you give us just a taste, a beginning taste of what the eternal home of the righteous is going to be like. And our biggest prayer this morning, as, as with anyone here, as we go back to our neighbors, as we go back to our jobs, to our leisure, that we can share this good news when other people are hurting, when other people are in tears and in mourning and in pain and in crying and going through death, that we can tell them good news. There's a new normal coming, and God offers it to you by his grace through Jesus Christ. May we continue to bring this good news to everyone you bring into our path. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to listen to this song. Just, you might want to close your eyes and take it in. It's like, yeah, well, let the song speak for itself.